Alright, this is a song called The Prince of Mayport, and it never really made it into a song. I wrote it a couple years ago, and I always wanted to make it into a song, and it never really found its place. And so it never ended up on a record. And I don't have it memorized, because it's long. But it's about a friend of mine, and it's about the beanpole with tussled hair and funny socks, the Yankee Crown Crusader, Mr. Mutton Chops. A six foot something in buttons, tall stretch of royalty was as steady as a Chevy, old yellow loyalty. Now the street sweeping dreamer lives the nightlife of the loner, and on a night like tonight he came upon a panicky homeowner. He pulled his sweeper to the curb to hear her saga sing. She said, my house is on fire, save my daughters and quick. The mother of the daughters, known throughout the land, tall drink of ex-beauty queen sought by many a man, and then her daughters were all followers of her beautiful traits, long-haired songbirds whose midtown movements would stop parades. And the prince jumped into action without any further ado, and asked for some directions to the blazing home current consumer. The on arriving, flames arising, eyes widened by the roaring fire, he saw the girls hanging from five different stories. He rolls his sleeves to his elbows, pulls his caps to his crown, inhales the jumbled letters of courage, and signs the whole word out. He steps to the house, feels that heat burn upon his face, prays to the ghost of Johnny Cash, and walks inside the place. There were hollers for help from every direction. Nearly naked in night things, the girls all vie for his protection. And the first was the worst, the thin blonde, deceptively heavy, pleading for protection of rings and things, exceptionally petty. The second was restless, born of limiting faith, questioning the prince, is this really gonna be safe? The third was a burden, but the prince just shrugged the pain away. The fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, eighth, and ninth were all the same. Begging and crying, save my dog, carry my dress, burying the prince down in flickering smiles, selfish requests. But he still picked up, lifted up, everyone left. Two girls on each arm, one on his head, four on his chest. Each set of lips had a private wish on flowered breath, and each curving hip had him going back into the mess. Quitting was no option, even if it led to his death. Even the best of all, even the greatest would fail a test. But after load and burden, filled with clothes and curtains, his throat's hurting, death is certain, the prince returns into the burning. Building, losing feeling in his fingertips and arms, overwhelmed by all the effort, our good Samaritan succumbs, and on his slow descent, his eyes focus in on a shiny silhouette reaching out to hold onto his hand. It was the last of the daughters, embarrassed in hand and face, the picture of grace, slim Karen, but bearing a silent strength. She looks into the prince's eyes just before his vision pays and holds his hand and whispers, it's going to be okay. She picks up his broken frame and steps out of the flame lays him on the grass as the last of the house collapsed into the blaze. And while the other daughters were all crying over diamonds, they forget about the prince laying unconscious and silent. Except for the last. He sits and waits, worried by the man, waiting for his eyes to open up, never letting go of his dirty hand. The prince told me this tale, somber and straight-faced, over some cups of bitter coffee and a couple of blue plates. I trust his every word because I've known him all my life. But if you don't believe the story, you can go ask the prince's wife.